Hello and welcome to another episode of the e-commerce coffee break podcast. Today we want to find out how you can successfully expand your e-commerce business into Europe. Now, a while ago we spoke about the other way around and Europe is a little bit more difficult than expanding into the US. So I want to talk about this and dive a little bit deeper into this topic. With me on the show today is Bjorn van Brockel. He is the vice president of sales supply. Inc. He has been part of sales supply operations since 2016 and heads up the US branch located in Miami. Sales Supply helps e-commerce business scale both domestically and internationally. They have enabled many US-based e-commerce businesses to successfully expand and scale overseas, including body engineers, commodity fragrance, Tory Brudge, and many, many others. So let's dive right into it and welcome Bjorn to the show. Hi Bjorn, how are you today? Good, thank you, Klaus. Thank you for having me. Bjorn, what do you see are some of the biggest challenges that US-based e-commerce companies typically face when they are looking to expand into Europe? What we see is that uh, a lot of U.S. companies who want to start in Europe, uh, the market has a lot of similarities compared to the U.S., but there are also a lot of differences. So one of the challenges um, a lot of U.S. brands are facing is how to deal with different languages. Uh, that's a really important challenge uh, when it comes to uh, how to reach your customers. Um, for example, the customer service in Europe are you going to offer one uh, language? Are you only going to offer English? Or are you also going to have uh, customer service in, let's say, German, Spanish, Italian, and all the other languages? That's one big challenge that a lot of U.S. brands are um, are dealing with when they want to start selling in uh, Europe. Another um, important challenge and another um, important strategy they have to they have to consider to take is are they kind of uh, the differences in culture? So what is the buying behavior from a customer in Italy compared to a customer in Netherlands? Uh, are you going to target all the customers in Europe? Because the European market has a huge potential. It has over 700 million potential customers, uh, but there are also a lot of differences. Also, for example, in Italy, um, Italian customers are uh, used to using cash on delivery as a checkout. In Netherlands, a lot of Dutch customers are using Ideal as a payment method for their checkout. So how are you dealing with those challenges? Are you going to offer all the different payment methods or are you also going to just focus on one market? These are important things to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, we already can see that there's a lot of different um, areas that we can look into and we have not even spoken or not even looked into legal and regulatory differences there. Yes. What are the, the first kind of critical first steps that an e-commerce business should look into when they look over the pond into Europe? I will say one of the, the things we always uh, tell the clients to start with are actually two things. Look at the differences in rules and, and, and the regulations. Um, examples from our clients, one of our clients, Segway, uh, we see the electric scooters here a lot in, uh, in Florida, but I know that in certain areas in Europe, the product is not allowed to drive on the streets. So that's a big difference. Um, of course, also when you look at the battery of the product in the US, it's different than in, in Europe. Um, but we also have examples of clients which we had with, um, they were selling a, a super glue product. Um, very successful and easy for us to, uh, to ship here in the US. But the rules and the regulations in Europe were completely different. So they had to change almost all the ingredients of their product in order to be able to sell this in Europe. So there are a lot of differences. Um, also, when you look at the European market, it's a market that is highly developed and very competitive. So that's also something uh, which we always tell our clients, uh, don't expect short-term success in such a mature and big market um, so that's that's those are things that are important to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. You mentioned there's more than 700 billion um, customers or potential customers in Europe compared to I don't know 300 billion in in the US. Obviously, a huge market. From your point of view, what what's the strategy to to open the market? Would you go for one country or five or all of them? What's what's the idea? Yes, I will. Um, that's one of the reasons why we offer um, local fulfillment to our customers. Uh, you want to compete like a local. So uh, a good strategy is to send product to, um, we always recommend to start in Netherlands because of two reasons. Uh, has to do with the VAT deferment. 
So it has a positive impact on your cash flow to have stock in Netherlands. Uh, so you can also, it comes of course with a big investment starting to sell in Europe. So you can allocate the cash flow to, for example, marketing and, and other parts. Um, and the infrastructure in Netherlands. Netherlands has a big port, the port of Rotterdam, one of the biggest ports in Europe. So it's um, easy access for ocean freight. Uh, the same as the airport, Amsterdam Schiphol, um, so for air freight, and as well as the country itself. Um, our warehouses are really close to the German border, so it's only about 20 minutes away from Germany. So we can easily inject our parcels for our customers, for example, with DHL uh, Germany. Um, and then when you look at transit times uh, from Netherlands to Germany, it's a standard one to two days. So there's also a big cost saving. So in the beginning, it makes sense to have one uh, hub to have your stock in Europe. Um, and then from there, start growing little by little. Uh, but that's a, that's a good strategy to start with. Mm -hmm. Walk me through the process of going through the different process steps. You mentioned at the beginning, you need to have a localized website, for instance. Uh, you need to have domestic or uh, local payment gateways and so on and so forth. Uh, what what kind of process steps do I need to follow before I can really start selling the product? Um, one of the things you need in Europe is an AORI number uh, and you need a VAT number. So those are the two essential um, and the minimum requirements to have in order to be able to start selling in Europe. And then from there, um, since we only take care of the local customer service and the global fulfillment for our clients, there are also, of course, other things to take into consideration, as you just mentioned, um, also to make sure that um, the web shop is localized, um, marketing, uh, also do enough market research. So really look at the different cultures and the buying behaviors from your customers, because it's very different, uh, each country, and um, that's, that's an important thing to take into consideration as well. Um, and what I said, uh, try to really compete as a local. So have your stock at least in Europe, so you can also ship from Europe to your customers. Uh, we have examples of customers uh, where they start as shipping from the US. If you sell a little bit heavier bulky products, let's say 40, 50 pounds, uh, a shipment from the US to a customer in Germany, can easily be over 100 euros. Um, if you ship that same parcel from Netherlands to your customer in Germany, you're talking about roughly 10 euros. So if you want to have a good conversion, it is really important that you also compete like a local. And these are just examples. It's the same for the SLA with the customer service. We offer shared solutions, so you don't pay for dedicated seats to start in the markets in Europe so you have shared agents, so you can easily have six, seven countries where you have shared agents. It's really important also to have a local phone number on your website. Customers, they can reach out because we all have like native customer service agents all located in those countries, almost in all countries in Europe. Um, it's really important for you when you start selling in Europe to take those things into consideration. Mm -hmm. I want to dive a little bit deeper into that. Now you have, you said you're providing the customer service agents. Obviously they need to do, know about the products. They need to have some kind of background about your company and so on and so forth. Correct. How does the, tra how does the training look like? How long does that take? Yes. So we have, um, during the training, there is a product training. There is also a training regarding the policies of the client. So it's multiple, uh, training sessions with the client. So we really become an expert on their product um, and based. And after that, once we start going live, you see that the majority of the questions, our, uh, our agents are able to, uh, to handle those. Mm -hmm. Now with Europe, you have all these different languages. How difficult is this to find um, agents that speak, I don't know, Slovenian or Greek? Yeah, I mean, it can be a challenge for us. It's relatively easy since we also have offices in all those countries in Europe. So we have the agents um, located in our offices in all those countries. Um, and that's also where we add value for our clients. If clients have questions about specific markets, let's say the market in Poland, uh, we have an office in Poland. So we have a lot of knowledge and experience about that specific market. So we have our colleagues in that market who can then give 
uh, tips and tricks and advice to our clients on how to become more successful in those markets. Mm -hmm. uh, you said you're working on the fulfillment, you're working on the e-commerce and the company itself is in the United States. Now, time zones is a bit of, can be an issue there. How does that work? How can I manage my fulfillment team, how, my support team in Europe while I'm based in, let's say, New York? Yes, that's a good question, Klaus. Um, we have offices worldwide. Uh, also, our headquarters are based out of Netherlands. That's where we started 15 years ago. Uh, I'm responsible for the for the US. But when we look at US companies who are um, selling into Europe and who use our solutions, uh, we really take over their day-to-day -day operations. So you have an account manager who takes over the day-to-day -day questions and when it comes to the fulfillment so there might be a challenge when it comes to uh, time difference, but we tackle most of the operational questions ourselves uh, in Europe because you're completely right. That's also one of the reasons why we offer um, our shared customer service solutions because when you're based out of the US, um, there is a six or nine hour time difference on average with Europe. So it's very hard to manage those things yourself, but that's really where we take over the operation and help our clients to be successful in those markets. Mm -hmm. Are there any specific industries or niches that you see right now that are really doing very well in Europe compared to, I don't know, other things that do not so well when it comes to, yes, suppliers? Um, well, we still see there um, when it comes to the, uh, the beauty and the fashion industry, um, as well as the electronics, those are really, um, are really successful. Um, we serve many different, uh, industries in Europe. Um, what we also see is the marketplaces. Uh, we do see more and more of our clients are also using multiple marketplaces in Europe. Um, it's not only Amazon in, uh, in Europe. We work with a lot of, uh, in Europe, there are a lot of local heroes. So for example, in Netherlands, uh, one of the most popular platforms is ball.com. Um, and for each country, there are different marketplaces that are definitely interesting and important to take into consideration. And when you're a US brand and you want to start selling in Europe, uh, yes, Amazon is also uh, operating out of Europe. So you can definitely use Amazon, but also keep in mind that there are a lot of different local heroes, we call them. Um, and those platforms are also very interesting to take into consideration when you start selling in, uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of a, a brand, a company that you worked with that expanded into Europe and what kind of success they saw? Uh, yes, we actually, um, um, one of our clients, uh, Commodity Fragrance, they sell perfume. So that's, um, that's a difficult product to ship overseas, uh, also due to the hazardous goods um, and the ingredients of the product. Um, once they actually started um, using our location from the Netherlands, uh, their order volumes went up um, and we helped them already for many, many years. Um, and we actually do see that for them, it was, a, it was a, a good platform to use us to grow the market in Europe. So throughout the years, we only see the orders growing uh, since we offer a good stable solution in Europe. Um, and that actually helped them a lot because if they actually had to ship this product from the US to their customers in Europe, and uh, when it comes to shipping fees and transit times, you win on both sides where you ship locally. Uh, what's also important for us, since we help hundreds and hundreds of um, companies cross border, is that we offer uh, low entry solutions because we want them to grow in those markets. So we don't charge certain minimum monthly fees uh, that's the same for our customer service model. Uh, it's a shared model, so you can test markets with us. If you want to see how um, uh, how the German market is for you, um, we can just set up a shared um, solution in uh, for the customer service in Germany. Uh, and that's the same for the fulfillment. Uh, we can operate from one location. And once the brands and the companies start growing with us, we can easily add locations. Um, so we can also say we, we ship stock to our location in, in Italy, in Spain, in France, in Germany, other countries as well. Now, let's assume I'm a, a small, medium enterprise, DTC, being on Shopify, I want to 
venture into the European market. What's the timeline? What's the onboarding process? How does that look like? Yes, for us, it's typically only a couple of weeks um, since the Shopify integration is a plug and play. Um, the biggest challenge is um, for them to actually, uh, in terms of the timeline, is to get the product to us in our warehouse since they, of course, have to order them more product, most likely from the manufacturer. Um, and it typically, I would say, it takes around uh, a month to get the Iori VAT number. You can expedite it a little bit, but if you want to be on the safe side, it will be around a month. Um, and within that month, we can set up the fulfillment and we can also set up the customer service for our clients. Mm -hmm. If I grow in Europe and I need more people to help me on the fulfillment, but also in, in the customer service, because of the customer service is quite important um, that, that you provide a good customer service, how quickly can I grow there? Yes, uh, for us, once we have you um, on board, once we, uh, we can easily add countries, uh, since we also do internal trainings ourselves, so um, you are basically within two weeks, you will be live in new markets as well uh, in Europe. So it's, it's, it's very quick, very fast. Uh, that's the same for the fulfillment. Once we have the integration in place, you can also start sending product to us, to our different warehouse locations, uh, since it's for us just a mapping. Um, so we can just fulfill those orders from those specific uh, warehouse locations. Mm -hmm. What kind of homework do I have to do as a merchant before I can get started? Um, it's important for us, of course, to provide us with all the data. So there is a, a little bit of work for you to do for the setup. And uh, when you look at the customer service part, uh, we will send you a questionnaire uh, in order to get all the information uh, regarding your product. So you will give us the product training and the product data, as well as your policies and the way how you operate and how you would like us to take care of your customer service inquiries. Uh, and on the fulfillment side, uh, we need to make sure that we have all your uh, SKU information. Uh, you will give us a, a one-time partner access, uh, for example, to your Shopify. And from there, we will take over uh, and we will build integration, um, but that's important. And on the fulfillment side as well, um, it's also important for us um, that's something which we discussed during the onboarding. How do you deal with, for example, uh, customer returns? Since we also offer returns in almost all countries in Europe, uh, when a customer wants to return something in Germany, you basically tell us all the, um, uh, all the steps we need to take to inspect the product and then in order maybe to put it back in stock or to ship it back to our location in the Netherlands. But we can consolidate all those returns in all those countries. And then we ship all those consolidated parcels back to Netherlands, if that's where you would like to start for the fulfillment. And then from there, we can put it back in stock. But that at least offers you a solution for your customers. Uh, that also helps you significantly when it comes to the conversion, when you have local um, solutions to handle the returns. And that's something which we also do um, so that is something which we will also discuss during the onboarding. Some clients have more technical products, so they also would like us um, to do some more steps. For example, check the product, um, connect it to certain software. Uh, for other clients, uh, as simple as, for example, apparel, uh, we just check if there is a product tag, et cetera, if there is no damage, and then we can put it back in stock or consolidate it, whatever the client wants. We're very flexible when it comes to that. Yeah, great that you touched on returns. It was actually a question that I wanted to ask because obviously a business is only as good as your returns policy yeah. is and uh, fulfillment always goes in both directions. Now, who's your perfect customer? Um, that's a good question. When you look at it from a fulfillment um, point of view, um, I would say it's a customer that ships and uh, that has a D2C volume within Europe. Um, we also help, of course, with the B2B. Uh, so we do both. Uh, we ship to retailers, we ship to marketplace as well. But there should definitely be some uh, D2C volume uh, within Europe. Uh, products that are easy to, um, to handle in the warehouses uh, and then also a product that the carrier likes to, uh, to handle as well. Um, so that's um, uh, in terms of SKUs, uh, I would say 
a lower SKU count. Uh, sometimes you see when customers send, uh, sell thousands of different SKUs mm. and they only have a handful of orders. Um, that's um, uh, operational, a little bit more complex to uh, to deal with. So um, uh, a lower SKU. Um, and when it comes to the product itself, um, of course, we, we spoke about the rules and regulations in Europe. Um, so also always please take into consideration uh, if your product is a, a certain hazardous good, uh, if we can easily ship it to all the countries or if there are also restrictions. Uh, for us, an ideal customer, of course, is a customer where we can send our product throughout Europe uh, without any restrictions. Um, that's, a, yeah, that's a good customer for us. Mm -hmm. Oh, as complex as a topic it is, I think you need to have an expert to get all the questions answered that are coming up through the process. Is that something you help with in sort of consulting, coaching people through the whole process? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we do this on a daily basis. Uh, we talk to uh, um, companies every day to help them cross border, to help them starting in those markets. So what we offer is we offer um, a free, uh, um, basically uh, an intake call to see what the needs are for, for a company. And there is no one best way. It really depends mm -hmm. per company um, in terms of volumes, in terms of the markets they want to target, in terms of the product they have. So we really go into detail with this prospect uh, during this call to see what their needs are and how we can help them. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your pricing structure. How does that work? Um, in terms of our customer service, uh, we have a shared model. So um, you basically, we call them events. That can be a phone call, that can be an email, uh, a chat, social media. Um, and we only charge our clients for the events we actually um, uh, make in those specific countries. So um, that helps them to only pay for what, what they use. Um, and that's the same for the fulfillment. Uh, we have a small pick and pack fee uh, per order. And that's, um, and of course there is a, a small storage fee depending on how, how much product the, the customer is going to send to us. Um, but those are the two factors, uh, in terms of the pricing uh, and that helps also that helps the brand grow in those markets, because we see that a lot of us brands, when they start in Europe, the first few months, the volumes are relatively low. And that has to do with that they have to, um, that there are so many factors for them to take into consideration, to look into, to start up. Um, and then of course you want to have a partner that doesn't charge you thousands of dollars if the orders are not there. So that's why we offer these solutions, this pricing structure to really help them grow. And when they become more successful, we also see that of course. Mm -hmm. I want to go a little bit wider because you get the finger on the pulse of e-commerce. What kind of emerging trends do you right now coming up in the online retail landscape? Um, what we see a lot is the different, um, in terms of the different channels. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the marketplaces, um, well, in, in the US, we still see, of course, that, that Amazon is a big player, but we also see um, in Europe that there are a lot of other uh, developments uh, we have. Uh, partners who can um, who can also help with setting up on the marketplaces, and we do see that we have a lot of uh, clients which we help together. We help them with their fulfillment, and they're able to get them on board on 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 tens of different marketplaces at the same time in Europe. Um, so those partnerships that is definitely something from the last year or two years where we see that there is more demand. Um, so offer more like all-in-one solutions because yes, you want to sell on a marketplace in Europe, but then you also need to have a fulfillment partner who can accommodate that, who can help you with that. So we do see that those partnerships are becoming more important for us as well to offer those solutions for the clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I think most uh, merchants nowadays are selling omni-channel or multi-channel and yeah. are available on all platforms including their own platform, like a Shopify store or whatever they have um, to be in, in front of their customers. Before our coffee break comes to an end today, Bjorn, is there anything that you want to share with our listeners that we haven't covered yet? No, I think um, what's most important for them to know is uh, do your market research, uh, take it step by step. 
um, don't expect a short-term success in a market that's highly developed and, and competitive. Um, but Europe has so much potential. It's also good for you for um, in terms of the risk spreading uh, to start the market in Europe because it's a very mature market in general. Um, so I will say definitely look into it. Uh, we're here to help. We're here to um, uh, jump on a call with you to give you certain advice to see what the options are in, uh, in Europe. So we're more than happy to uh, to help. Okay. Where can people find out more about you? Um, I'll make sure that there is a link in the, in the podcast um, and then they can schedule a 15 or 30 minute call with me. Um, so I'll make sure to leave a, um, a link in the, in the, in the bio. Absolutely. Yeah. There will be a link directly going to you guys. Cool. Bjorn, thanks so much for giving us an overview on how to uh, can expand your business into Europe. I think a lot of brands in the US are interested in that and having a partner on their sites that helps with that is always a good idea. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Klaus. Hey, Klaus here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. Before we wrap things up, I've got a couple of important points to share. Firstly, if you have enjoyed today's episode and want to support the show, here's a simple way to do it. Help me out with that algorithm magic by liking, commenting, and subscribing on your favorite podcast app. And if you're feeling extra generous, leaving a rating would be great. Your support helps me bringing more impactful guests on the show, and it makes it easier for others to discover the podcast. Secondly, I want to talk about to all your business owners out there. Here's a question. Are you tired of juggling everything in your business while struggling with your marketing tasks? Fed up with hit and miss experiences of hiring freelancers or agencies that don't quite get your vision. But perhaps you're not ready to commit to a full-time in-house marketer just yet. Well, I've got a solution for you. Introducing our fractional marketing team. My team and I provide top-notch experienced marketing professionals to become an extension of your business. Not only will they save you up to 50% on cost compared to traditional hires, but they also take care of all this time-consuming, repetitive and complex marketing tasks that have been holding you back. And this way, you can concentrate on what truly matters, the core of your business. To learn more about how we can help you to scale up your online sales with a fractional team member, head over to our website, smart-ecommerce-marketing.com, or reach out to me directly and I'll get you the details. You will find the links in the show notes. Thanks for being a part of our podcast community, and remember, your support means the world to me. Until next time, see you then.